Funding for election 2014 coverage is provided in part by AARP, a nonprofit, nonpartisan association, 86,000 strong in North Dakota. AARP fights on real issues that matter to you and your family. And by the members of Prairie Public. Welcome to Prairie Public's continuing coverage of the 2014 elections. I'm Dave Thompson moderating this debate. This is for the Public Service Commission full six-year term. Our candidates are Todd Reisenauer and Brian Kalk. By a coin flip before this, we decided who was going to go first, and Todd Reisenauer will fire first. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Uh, thank you, uh, Prairie Public and uh, AARP for hosting this, this debate today. Um, I am not a, a politician. This is my, my first foray in, into this environment. Um, I've only worked in the private sector as, as a business consultant. I come from Dickinson, North Dakota. I'm a, a small, off a small ranch just southeast of the city. I'm a third generation North Dakotan. I'm a royalty owner. I'm a landowner. And the reason why I'm running in this public service race this year is because I think North Dakota at this time in our history as an opportunity to put ourselves on, on an economic map that, that um, will uh, be able to compete with states like California, like New York, like Texas for generations to come. That is my vision and that's what I want to bring to the public service. All right, Brian Kalk. Thank you, David. Just also thank Prairie Public and ARP for uh, sponsoring this debate. A little background about myself. I grew up in Botno, graduated high school in the 80s. Spent 20 years in the Marine Corps, retired, actually finished a doctorate teaching at North Dakota State. And it was just six years ago that I also was the newcomer to the uh, political field and jumped into the fray because I could see at that time the growth of energy development was coming in North Dakota. And with my natural resources background, I wanted to make sure we could develop our resources and also make sure we make sure we can farm and ranch for generations to come. I've uh, worked a lot hard to get energy security uh, throughout the state of North Dakota as it helps out in our national debate. And when I look back at the things that we've done in the last six years, we've we've added natural gas generation, we've added wind generation, we've made sure we found that balance. And there's still more work to be done, but I've got the background experience to keep getting the job done. All right, thank you both very much for your opening comments. We'll start with uh, Brian Kalk on this question. The Public Service Commission is talking about getting more into regulation of pipelines, especially oil pipelines and oil trains. So talk about that if you could. What should the Public Service Commission's role be in this? And as a follow-up, is the federal government doing enough? Sure. Thank you, Dave, for the question. I guess I'll step back just a little bit. The, the, uh, the Public Service Commission already has jurisdiction on a lot of natural gas lines, and over the last few years, natural gas lines have grown in the state. So we've gone through and asked for more inspectors for natural gas, we received those the last uh, legislative session. So it's important that the jurisdiction that we have, we keep doing a good job on it. But over the last couple of years, it's really highlighted the fact that the federal agencies that have oversight on interstate liquids uh, perhaps don't have enough inspectors. We go through with the siting of these pipelines, and then once the crude starts flowing, if you will, then it becomes federal jurisdiction. So uh, the discussion has certainly been opened up, and I think at this point the federal government is not doing enough. And so if North Dakota is going to continue to be a world-class energy producer, why not do it ourselves? So I put the idea forward well over a year ago on the, uh, the Hazardous Liquid Program. My counterpart, Commissioner Fedorchek, is taking the lead on the rail. But I think the backdrop here is if we develop a pipeline infrastructure that meets the needs, the pressure comes off the rail. And that's the key discussion is to make sure we've got the right amount of infrastructure to move this product and move it safely, get trucks off the road and get the traffic off the rails. So Todd Reisenauer, you've been talking about this issue as well, about regulation of rail and regulation of pipelines. Absolutely. Um, and it's, it's not just this big block of pipelines. It's, it's more complex than that. Um, you know, the, the feds have certainly, I think, have not done a good job. And my point is, it should be North Dakotans who do that job. We know what to do best. We know how to manage best. We know what, what's there. Um, so the infrastructure, and, and we're going back to older pipelines as well that nobody's really talking about. We're talking, we're talking new, building out new infrastructure. There's a lot of pipe in the ground right now that we necessarily don't know where, where it all is. So we've got to start with a, a baseline, with a pipeline audit, do a full account, everything. We, we know everything is, and then we build up from there. 
Um, but it, it's, a, it's a very complex issue, and I hope, hope one we come back to here, because I'm not sure in 30 seconds if we can, we can talk about all these, these different aspects. Well, I'll give you both a chance to talk a little bit more about it. Uh, Commissioner Call, what do you think about what uh, Todd Reidenauer said? Well, there's certainly a well-established protocol, if you will, of who does what as far as the Industrial Commission has the lead on gathering lines, and I think that makes sense. The Industrial Commission gives the permit for uh, extracting the oil out of the ground. I think they do a very good job with the, the uh, setting up of gathering lines. The last session, they now have to have gathering lines filed. Um, we do the interstate, if you will, the midstream, the, the interstate, the gas, interstate liquids. Uh, the feds have the role of uh, interstate. So I think the system is fine. I think what we have to do is continue to make sure we've got the right people doing the right job, make sure we're doing a good job. The uh, new technologies are coming out all the time. Uh, the commission, the jurisdiction that I have, I know where the pipelines are at. So there's other jurisdictions, I think, that have to keep working as well as we do. And some of the things that I think you really have to understand is that you know, what's the end state we're trying to get to? And I think we want to have that world-class transportation system that can make sure we move our commodities, whether it's oil, natural gas, whether it's uh, ag products, to get them to the markets, because that's what it's all about. North Dakota is number one in so many categories. We want to make sure we keep it that way, and we've got to make sure we farm and ranch at the end of the day as well. So, Todd, I'll give you one more shot. Yeah, so I think Brian and I agree, essentially agree, the vision here is a world-class uh, infrastructure. Uh, get your commodity to market as quickly and as efficiently as possible. I think where we disagree is um, what I see, it's a bureaucracy. I see five different agencies trying to do the same thing, essentially. Um, Tyler Axness and I proposed a plan to streamline. Um, and streamlining not only helps companies in, in figuring out how to site and how to permit and how to manage and, and, and inspect, but think about all the citizens out there, all the landowners, when they're trying to figure out a certain pipeline, well, is it a gathering? Is it a transmission? Was it retrofitted at some point? There's so many, and those are the complexities that I'm talking about that really confuse the public out there. So I think if we lead from the public service and we're able to, to uh, deliver that information to the public, it's going to create a lot less anxiety, a lot less of the, the disputes that we're seeing of, of landowners not knowing who to go to, who's responsible for it. Um, you know, we have issues with, with right away where in the second year of, of the maintenance program, you're starting to see a lot of unleveling. And a lot of, in many of these cases, people are left on their own. So th this, is, this is a huge issue. This, this is where I led, led off on my, my campaign was with how we're going to build this infrastructure out, but how we're not just going to forget about all this old existing infrastructure that's in the ground today. And, and so we need it all encompassing very uh, uh, comprehensive strategy to deal with, with uh, pipelines and how they're going to go on the ground and how we're going to inspect and manage what's already in the ground. I'd like to switch gears now and, and talk about the issue of alternative energy. We, North Dakota has been called the Saudi Arabia of wind and there's been a lot of wind development. We've got natural gas plants coming online. You don't necessarily call that an alternative energy, but there are other things that are, may still be out there such as solar and more hydropower. I'd like to start with Todd Reisenauer. What about North Dakota in terms of alter, alternative energy? Do, is this something the state should embrace more, do something more to encourage development of alternative it, energy? Absolutely it is. Um, it, one of the first questions as I'm out on the road uh, meeting with just you know, average, average people, farmers, is they ask me, what, what happened to the, 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 the Saudi Arabia of, of the prairie, the wind farms? Um, you know, there's certainly a lot of we just had one, one uh, cited here in western North Dakota, but from the, the initial talks of how this is going to transform our energy grid, it hasn't happened yet. Now that's kind of a two-part um, challenge. Some of it is the industry, some of it is, is uh, market capacity and, and the, the, um, the need for it. Um, but what I will say is the energy is there, um, the resource is there, we need to continue to figure out how to, to to maximize that resource, and and same thing with solar. Um, you know, the, the solar energy uh, right now is hardware is almost impossible to find because it's in such demand. Um, so I think there's there's an I definitely have an all of above strategy uh, when it comes to energy development. Um, you know, I think fossil fuels play a, a huge role. I think uh, clean coal, um, uh, natural gas, but we can't forget about what's coming in the future. And when I look at countries like Germany, India, China, um, you know, they've got a plan for renewables. And I think we need to catch up with them and, and figure out what the, the, not only the later 21st, but the 22nd uh, power grid might look like. 
All right, uh, to Brian Kalk, same question. Um, you know, with all this potential for alternative energy that people think is out there, is the PSC doing enough to to promote it? Is Should it be in a promotion role? Or how do you think the state is doing in terms of working on the all or all of the above strategy? Sure, one of the things that the Public Service Commission Companies want to build projects, they file an application, we hold a variety of hearings, and we decide whether the project is approved or not approved. The companies have to step forward and, and decide what type of energy they're going to have. And my time in the commission, we truly have done an all of the above energy. We fought hard to keep our coal fleets going. We've talked about next generation of coal. We captured a CO2 for oil recovery, very aggressive in citing natural gas to electricity plants. I'm um, actually worked in getting stakeholders together to get some base load natural gas plants throughout the state. And as far as wind, think back to just probably a decade ago, we had zero megawatts of wind power in North Dakota. Uh, since my time in the commission, we're now up to almost 2,000 megawatts of wind being cited. And so it's been tremendous, the amount of wind growth in the state. But I step back that our job is to do a couple things. Make sure we have reliable energy, but make sure we keep the costs down. You can put a whole bunch of renewables on the grid and drive up your cost of generation because you still have to have those renewables backed up by some type of base load. The windiest day in North Dakota, that's great. But the coldest day and the warmest day, the wind tends to not grow. So you've got to bring in the renewables at the right amount. And right now, numbers show anywhere from probably 15 to 20 percent is the right amount for reliability. You've got to keep a close eye on those costs as well, too. So I think we've done a great job of bringing in renewables as far as wind. I'm, I'm very skeptical of solar. I'm critical of the state of Minnesota that has a solar mandate because solar mandates or some type of mandate means that it, that generation have to be built no matter what the cost is. And then one of the challenging things we do is go through rate cases where the customers, they demand we keep their cost down of electricity the best we can. So you've got to bring in those renewables where you keep the cost steady. And um, you know we've brought a lot of renewables on the grid in the last, in my six years particularly, and I think we're going to keep doing that but you can't just drive up your cost of electricity, and you've got to make sure you keep that reliability factor there. Uh, Todd Reisner, I'll give you a chance uh, to yeah, respond. Yeah, it's kind of a macro um, uh, view of this. Uh, you know, I, I have a seven-year-old daughter, and um, uh, energy is going to look a lot different to her throughout her lifetime than, than Brian and mine's. Um, I look at, at, like I mentioned, India, China, um, with, with very uh, elaborate uh, renewable programs. And it's been said that, that uh, cheap renewable energy is going to be the atomic bomb of, of the 20, late 21st and 22nd century. So that's, as we progress and we think about, yes, uh, cheap energy, uh, reliable energy, what we have today. But still in the back of my mind, the vision is we need to find a way that we're going to compete in a long, and, and not just a, a 10, 20, 30 year uh, time scale, but a, a generational type scale. So that's that's also weighing heavily on, on my, my decision making. And Brian Kalk, would you like one more word? Or well, just that the uh, all above energy strategy means all of the above. And we've got an administration in D.C. that does not want an all of the above energy strategy. That's one of the biggest challenges I face in the Public Service Commission is, you know, the federal government and the EPA is trying to shut down our coal generation fleet. And so you talk about having a reliable, affordable grid. You know, there's a lot of people that talk about they want to keep an all of the above, but they really don't. Well, it's amazing you mentioned that because my next question has to do with the EPA, the new carbon reduction rules that are going to be in place, I believe, by 2030. And... Uh, in terms of just how, you know, what is going to happen to North Dakota's coal fleet, uh, what do you think of the, uh, North Dakota is going to have to reduce its carbon footprint by about 11%. We're probably one of the better states in the union, but there's still a lot of complaint that, you know, coal may go the way of the dinosaur. So I'll start with Brian Kalk. Uh, what about the whole EPA rules and how should they be changed? Sure, Dave, uh, <laughs> great question. One thing I always talk about is these rules are proposed right now. They don't become final till the June of 2015. So some folks are saying, well, these rules are okay for North Dakota. We don't know what the final rules are gonna look like. And so, the, you know, I, I always caution anyone to say, this is what the final rule is gonna look like. Uh, interestingly enough, the president and EPA extended the comment period from October 15th to, to a few months later. And I think that's more of this delay, delay, delay strategy. So what we've done in the Public Service Commission is taken an aggressive role, not to debate global warming, but to debate the cost impact and the reliability impact. Uh, we just had a, uh, the, the leader from the NERC, the National Reliability Coordinator out here, and my former colleague, Commissioner Tony Clark, who's on the FERC, and they both admitted that uh, there's been no modeling done how this is gonna impact the grid. There's been no assessment. So I guess my role in the Public Service Commission is to be as aggressive as I can to 
educate the consumer about the impacts of these rules, to understand what's coming, to make comments uh, as appropriate, and try to steer this discussion so we can use coal for the next generation. And um, you know, Southern Company is a leader. I brought them up here a few uh, months ago about they're using uh, lignite coal, capturing the CO2 for an ancillary recovery. I think that's what we should get to, the win-win for everyone. But as far as these EPA rules, it's amazing. The administration uh, started this attack uh, back at, well, long before 2009, but that's when I became involved with the cap and trade. And there are a lot of folks out there that say they want coal, but they really don't. Todd, your turn. You know, I, I think uh, this, when I, when I announced my, my candidacy, I, I remember getting this question in my press conference then. And um, I, I, I'm a Western North Dakota kid. We grew up burning lignite coal from, from Wyoming in our, our, our wood burner. Um, so I know that smell, I know the, um, the heat, and, and I know the energy it produces. I, I've been around coal for, for my entire life. And um, I think right now, where we're, it's where we're at. It's, um, we need to produce energy from coal. It's, it's as simple as that. And, and the EPA rules, I think, came off a little, as, as Brian would say, half-baked. Um, they don't really truly understand the full implica implications of, of those rules. Um, it's similar, and, and I know I'm going to probably catch a little bit of fire for this. It reminds me a little bit of, of some of the, the governor's flaring uh, uh, rules that have been put in place because you really don't understand the full impact until something. You just throw these arbitrary rules out there, and industry has to adjust. And, and I, I think many times it's just unfair, and, and we're definitely going to see some, some ramifications. So as PSC commissioner, I will do whatever I need to do, whatever I can do, um, to, to make sure that, uh, that the EPA had, understands what North Dakota clean coal is all about. I'd like to follow, follow that up, and I'll, I'll ask Brian again. What can or what should the PSC do because your job is a regulator? Well, what we, what we have done is we've made it very uh, clear what our position is. We're going to be filing our official comments to the EPA. But I think what's going to come down to is this is going to be a, a, a big battle between states' rights and federal rights. If the EPA tries to continue to push this, somebody in the state's going to litigate it. And what will end up happening is company X will come in and try to get cost uh, return on something that we don't think was an appropriate cost. Uh, we'll probably, let's say, hypothetically not approve those costs, and we'll end up having that, that battle back and forth. But what we've got to do is stay aggressive to make sure we meet the needs of energy demand and protect the consumers. So we'll use our authority under North Dakota law to do that, and I think that's where, as this thing unfolds, you'll see the difference in what the EPA is trying to do to what a state's rights is. And, Todd, you have the final word on this. Um, you know, it just, uh, I, I think Brian and I are, are very close on, on this issue. Um, Brian's very passionate uh, with, with the EPA and, and fighting, fighting the, the federal kind of uh, overreach. Um, well, I think one area we, w we differ is that passion, the passion I have is for the consumer, for uh, farmers out there who have insolvency issues with their elevator. That's I, the level of passion I bring to both sides of this. So um, I can agree with Brian 100 percent that, that uh, the government, we, there is not a, a one-size-fits-all energy strategy from Washington, D.C. will not work in North Dakota, but there's a lot of other pieces to this puzzle that we've got to be mindful to, that we've got to be, uh, that we've got to listen to and be responsive to as well. Okay, the next question I have has to do with consumers and about pricing. And we'll start with uh, Todd Reisenauer on this one. And it goes back to the Big Stone Power Plant. When the Big Stone Power Plant was being, you know, Big Stone 2 was being discussed, the Public Service Commission, by state law, had to go with an advanced determination of prudence. And also, uh, they, the people who built Big Stone or were going to build Big Stone were able to charge consumers right away. Uh, that's under state law. A, is that a fair state law? B, should it be changed? And would you lead the, the effort to change it? Absolutely. I, I, again, as, as I was just saying, um, the public service commission should be out. Their, their first job is looking out for, for the citizens, for the, the consumers. And uh, in hearing that, I mean, that, that is an unfair uh, situation for, for consumers, and that's something that I would, I would look to change um, instantly. Okay. Brian Call. Just, I guess, the, uh, you know, when that uh, commission at that time approved that I was not on the commission, but I certainly dealt with some of the follow-up while I was on the commission. And one of the things that became very clear was is that the ADP law, when it was written up, was, was not very clear about some of the things. And I think one of the things that the commission really learned from that is when to have that collar on those costs. 
So in ADPs that we've been involved in since that, we put a really tight collar on when those costs can be, uh, can be reimbursed, if you will. But as far as the ADP law itself, um, I have been critical of the ADP law, where I think that sometimes the companies want the Public Service Commission to be their board of directors. It's up to them to make decisions. But I'll say the flip side of it is the ADP law, if a company is going, let's say a company like Excel Energy, let's say they want to build you know, 1,000 megawatts of solar, and all of a sudden they just build it ahead of time, by the time that would come back to us in a rate case, it'd be really tough to work its way through on that one. So in, in those cases, it's better, I think, with a company to come forward and ask for ADP out of something out of the norm so they can hear early from the commission what our concerns are. But as far as uh, tweaking the law or maybe even changing the law, I would be happy to have that debate because um, I've been very critical of the ADP law since I've been there because right now there's no cost benefit that ADP helps the consumer. Nobody has ever proven that. And uh, so that's the part that I think having the debate is always important, but the ADP law kind of cuts both ways, but I do think it's something that I'd be happy to, to talk about and to tell the legislative body just what I said right now is there's pros and cons to it. But the big thing is nobody's been able to prove that that benefits the consumers. Now this is another issue that I want to get into and Ryan Kalk will be first on this one. It's about the status of the power grid here because there's been a lot of discussion that maybe it's an aging grid and we've had some power problems, especially in the Fargo area where XL Energy had some power outages. You had a reliability seminar. So what is your opinion of the status of the grid? What needs to be done to make sure it's reliable? Sure. It's interesting. My first act back in January of 2009 was uh, to open up an investigation on XL Energy reliability in the Thompson area. And it's been a constant uh, struggle since that period of time. And I think that the expectation of the power grid is going to be there all the time is a good expectation, but we've become so reliable on 100% power that nobody has backup generation. So when we do lose power, it has much more impacts than it used to have. We're so much more reliant. But to get to your question directly, the, uh, in my time in the commission, we've cited several major 345 kV lines. It's the first time that's been done in over 30 years in the commission because of growing energy demands, because of also aging infrastructure. I've been very aggressive in leading the charge to make sure we actually have the hearings and then cite these pipelines and companies can construct them. The XL CapEx line that's uh, in final construction phase is right here in Fargo. A lot of folks were against that and I said, listen, if we don't make the investments now, build this transmission line, Fargo's not gonna meet demand. So you've gotta have a robust system of generation, getting back to our discussion about coal, natural gas, wind, you've gotta have a robust system of generate or transmission to get it to the cities. And once it's in the cities, you've gotta make sure they've got a good distribution network that has aggressive tree trimming. Uh, the couple rate cases ago, we directed Xcel Energy to hire a dedicated electrical engineer. So I would say our grid is continuing to get better and better. The goal is 100% and we won't stop until we get that goal understanding that Mother Nature is always going to have a play. So Todd Reisenauer, your response, about a minute. Um, you know, I think two different things going on. The, 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 the large scale, um, you know, for example, getting power to Williston, things like that, the uh, CapEx program. Um, I think w when I look at the reliability of the grid, I'm, I'm looking more uh, at the micro scale issues the, 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 uh, uh, in the neighborhoods. And if you travel certain areas to, to Northern Fargo, Northern Fargo, excuse me, um, yeah, there, there's areas that haven't been upgraded for quite some time, and, and I would find it very hard to believe that uh, that, that outdated equipment uh, wouldn't be the cause for a lot of these failures. So, yes, uh, mega scale uh, power, that, that's one thing, but what we need to focus on right now is uh, within the neighborhoods, especially some of the older neighborhoods in Fargo, to getting them up to code, so to speak. Um, that that would be a major initiative of, of, of something that I would undertake at the PSC. All right, gentlemen, time is fleeting, so <laughs> it is time for our closing comments, and Brian Kalk will get the first bite at the apple. Well, thank you, Dave. It seems like it goes so darn quick. Uh, there was one last thing I wanted to hit on, is it's the, my favorite call before you dig. I've been very aggressive in forcing the call before you dig, and you think about it takes so much work to make sure we properly site a pipeline, make sure we protect our broadband, make sure we put our electricity in the ground correctly, make sure we keep doing great things with that. And I've been a leader in that since I've got there, uh, actually hold companies accountable for not doing things right. And back to where I started in the very beginning, just thank Prairie Public and AARP, ARP for this debate. Um, the election's coming up very soon. I'd ask for your vote on November 4th, and so I can keep doing what I've started with, making sure North Dakota continues to keep North Dakota prosperous, meet that national need, and help our country become energy secure. Thank you. Now to Todd Reisenauer. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dave, once again, and, and uh, Prairie Public, AARP. Um, 
where we are in North Dakota today, there, there is definitely, we, we've never been better. Um, I will say that up front. Uh, I've lived through uh, drought, uh, near depression on a farm in the 1980s. Um, had to pay uh, you know, out of pocket to go to college in, in the 90s. Um, watched a lot of my friends who I graduated with from college move out of state. And then now a lot of them are coming back here to, to work in, in different industries. So it's a great time to be in North Dakota. My mission, my, my vision here uh, at the PSC is to build uh, uh, infrastructure that is going to last for centuries, a, a, a grid, a uh, pipeline infrastructure, a manufacturing base that's going to diversify our economy. So 40 years from now, whenever this, this oil boom may, may start waning off, we've got other jobs. We've got a manufacturing sector. We've got an educational technical sector big plan that I have for North Dakota is rather than seeing a, a lot of uh, flares on, along Interstate 2, power grids, server farms, data centers. That's my vision for North Dakota. But with that, I, I, I look forward to uh, many more debates possibly with Brian, but uh, I, I appreciate your support and, and uh, thank you for allowing me to be here today. And I would like to thank our two candidates for the Public Service Commission, Brian Kalk and Todd Reisenauer. Thank you both very much for a good discussion. And I'd like to thank AERP, our partners in this debate. Remember, Election Day is November 4th. For Prairie Public, I'm Dave Thompson. Funding for election 2014 coverage is provided in part by AARP, a nonprofit, nonpartisan association, 86,000 strong in North Dakota. AARP fights on real issues that matter to you and your family. And by the members of Prairie Public.